Uh, so it's starting to get quieter. Um, uh, so um, my class is uh, in the School of Sustainability, uh, Sustainable Energy Technologies and Systems. And in the class, we kind of, we do a little bit of kind of a physics for dummies on the energy system. And, um, and then we do, uh, we do a lot of financial calculations to find out what things gonna cost, whether it's worth it to do this. And so um, it's been great to have this project uh, brought in. This is the first time I've done a, a city of a Project Cities project with my full class. Um, and so it's been a learning experience for me, but also um, it's been really great to have a real world problem um, to solve. And the students were very excited to get me to shut up and stop lecturing. Um, and so this, this has been really an interesting uh, experience for them. And I'd like to basically echo what uh, Dr. Chester said, that we are not quite done. Um, this is a presentation of, of, where, of, our, of our results, but um, we are looking, we're, we're still working on the uh, report. And so the final report will be uh, reflecting some of the comments that you all have for us today. So we're really looking to get that feedback and what you want to know more about. Um, and if you have uh, criticisms or like, maybe just send an email to me uh, and then we'll, we'll, we'll work it in there. But, uh, and then the students, uh, this class is a little bit smaller than the last class. We only have 12 students and only about half of them were able to make it here. Um, some of them are in exams and stuff. So uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to the students and let them present what they've found on uh, the flea electrification for Peoria. How's it going? Uh, my name is Brian Neal. I'm an engineering management undergraduate student uh, taking this course for my minor in sustainability. And Leah, let's go ahead and uh, introduce everybody. Hi, I'm Renee. I'm a student in the School of Sustainability. Hi, um, my name is Hermann Slough. I'm also a student in the School of Sustainability. Hi, guys. My name is Kim, and I'm also in the School of Sustainability. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Just like everybody up here, I, my name is Rebecca, but I'm part of the School of Sustainability as well. Same for me as well. My name is Erica. All right, and we're here to talk about fleet electrification and, uh, you know, our professor here over there. Uh, and it's uh, SS324, Sustainable Energy Technology Systems. Uh, so this is kind of an overview of what we're going to go over in this presentation. We're going to talk a, a little bit of the background, what the current composition of the fleet is, uh, possible options for transitioning vehicles, infrastructure modeling, which will be a video from the, uh, the team that did that, and then results from the research and analysis. So the current fleet composition, Peoria's fleet is comprised currently of 31 sedans, 105 SUVs, six buses, 38 vans, both cargo and passenger, and 324 trucks. So that includes like your F-150s type trucks all the way up to your uh, Peterbilt massive uh, beast of trucks. Uh, and this does not include the any um, uh, law enforcement uh, sedans is not included in this number, but this does include law enforcement SUVs. Uh, current fuel consumption for those vehicles that are listed before, so it's 504 vehicles in total, are uh, they use over 275,000 gallons of gasoline and 312,000 gallons of diesel. And that adds up to at, you know, current market value of, of those fuels is over a um, million and a half dollars per year, as well as 5,600 metric tons of uh, CO2 greenhouse gas emissions per year. And uh, if, you know, all that was sent to, uh, to uh, you know, to auction right now would be uh, over eighteen million dollars. So, uh, are we the only uh, municipality that's like, thinking about this? Obviously, of course not. Obviously, right? <laughs> We've got um, 
uh, lots of the, the major municipal areas, uh, Los Angeles, San Francisco, New York, Seattle. Uh, something uh, recently that we saw in the news is Montgomery County, Maryland is replacing their school bus fleet of uh, 1,400 uh, internal combustion engine buses, and they're trying to aim to completely phase out those over the next 12 years, and just recently placed the largest order of electric buses in the country. So now we're taking a look at um, all our vehicles. We um, classified them all. And then from there, we kind of did a little rundown on the replacements, kind of those savings and all that. So for the half ton truck, our recommendation would be the Ford F-150 Lightning. You can see the cost and energy demand it would take um, per year to charge. We got that energy demand um, number based on how many average miles these half ton trucks um, kind of travel, um, given the information you all gave us. So we kind of calculated the energy demand that it would require for that. And so um, currently there are no major savings um, if the replacement um, would be with an electric um, Ford F-150 Lightning truck. Um, to replace all the um, half-ton trucks, there would be additional costs that range from $500 to as much as $13,000 over the vehicle's lifetime. But um, on average, um, the Lightning is not cheaper. Um, there are 15 out of the 142 um, vehicles that are viable for EV replacement, which means it would save you money if you um, switch to these um, vehicles over the vehicle's lifetime. And um, just a quick little note, um, on the screen you can see there's 172 half-ton trucks and we only calculated for 142. That is because um, there was no, um, um, there was a lack of operating data for um, 30 of those trucks. And so that's um, the half-pound um, half truck, the SUV. All right, and so these are the SUVs that are currently in use for which we found an EV replacement that is suitable to be the VW ID4. Um, the SUVs are one of our areas with the most potential savings if we replace them with an EV. And um, although there were some losses for some of the uh, SUVs that the data showed were newer, had less mileage, um, there are potential savings of up to 56,000 over the vehicle lifetime. All right. And then for sedans. Thank you. All right, and then we have here the sedan. Um, with our research, we only found that maybe about 15 sedans currently in use for the fleet would be viable to replace. Um, with that being said, that's based on the mileage of what the sedans are using. And of course, these are um, non-law enforcement vehicles. Our recommendation is to replace those with the Chevy Volt EV. These ones are actually a really big savings right now on the market. And then you can actually save up to $6,200 per vehicle that's being saved. Um, and then also if you take a look at the emissions being saved on each slide, that's also a big point of ours as well. Um, for the cargo vans, we recommended to switch out uh, the Ford E350 with the Ford E-Transit. There are some losses with the EV replacements between a few hundred to 6,000, but we can still replace 10 out of 25 cargo vans with savings up to 59,000 over the vehicle lifetime. All right, so you guys are currently using the Arbuck Spirit of Mobility. Uh, they have a lifespan of about 12 years, meaning it'll take about a decade or so before you have to replace them. Um, but with the current budget and pricing, for our EV alternative, which is the Arbok Equus Charge, costs about 800,000 for the acquire cost is a little steep. Uh, it will be about five times over the cost of your internal combustion engine replacement, making it a very impractical switch. Um, and although it saves about 1,000 grams of carbon dioxide per mile, uh, it's not a purchase that the city could easily offset. And if the EV, if the city were to still go through with the EV recommendation, uh, it would result in a loss of up to five hundred ninety-four thousand over its lifetime. Big financial setback. Um, but, good to know. But for the light duty truck, you guys have a variety of different Ford F two fifties in use. Uh, each truck has a lifetime of about 10 years. Some of your guys' earliest ones are from 2005 or a 2005 model. Uh, so we are approaching about the time where we need to replace them. And we do have a few newer models too coming from 
about two, uh, 2021, 2022. Uh, so those ones a little later down the road, but similar to what was discussed earlier by Armas, uh, there are no major savings between using the uh, conventional replacement and the EV replacement of the F-150 Lightning. Uh, many of them would be needed to be replaced sooner or later, so you can go with the EV, kind of save a little more money in the long run, because um, you get about 30k in savings, which is pretty nice. All right, and then for the medium duty truck, uh, in our research, we found that there are 17 F-350s in use, and those are early 2000 models that are being used right now, most, most predominantly for um, for firefighter use right now. Um, so these ones, we actually did find found a savings using the Chevy Silverado, switching those ones out. Um, right now, the cost is actually gonna be saving some money um, with rising purchase prices of replacing those vehicles with newer models of F-350s, and then also lifetime maintenance costs going up. This one would actually give you an average savings about 14,935 per vehicle. And finally, we have the passenger van. So um, you can read all that information up there. The main summary we get from this is that um, we um, lose a lot of money if we switch um, the passenger van, if we replace it with the Mercedes-Benz e Vito Tourer. Um, those um, losses or costs um, over the vehicle's lifetime would be around um, $30,000, um, more than the conventional um, vehicle. And um, so, would not be very viable um, to switch um, the passenger van to an electric vehicle. Um, yeah. And then, so what are the savings? So um, just before we get into that, um, our methodology. So we took the existing fleet inventory and from there we kind of identified all the conventional options. We switched them up. Um, we um, divided them up into those categories. Those are the categories you just saw. Um, from there with the conventional op um, options, we calculated the annual miles, the operated, operating and ma um, maintenance cost, um, the replacement cycle, all of that. All of that was um, put into a calculation and then we got the discounted total cost of ownership. And then for the EV option, we did the same thing, but we included the charger requirements, the infrastructure cost, the weekly overnight charging, all of those things, the acquired cost, the resale value, um, all of that, and um, that's how we got the dis discounted total cost of ownership for the EV. The difference between the conventional and EV total um, cost of ownership is where we get those EV savings, and you'll see those on the next slide. And on this slide, we'll see the average cost of each vehicle class. We took an average of what we could consider switching um, on each class. And so in previous slides, you saw the number of vehicles that we were considering. And so for most of them, there is a negative value of savings just based on the numbers that we had. As previously mentioned in our methodology, we use the acquired cost, discount rate, lifetime, operation and maintenance, fuel, resale for the current class that we're using. And for the EVs, we assume that we would be using an L2 charger with an overnight charging rate of that charger of about eight hours each night. And of course, that number is subject to change based on the vehicle and usage. And additionally, this number at the moment, we assume $0 for subsidies. So if those were to be um, changed, these numbers would change as well. Additionally, for the EV vehicles, we did not account for the demand rate just because there's high variability between locations and between APS and SRP. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about infrastructure, which includes the charger types, uh, the locations where we're gonna put the chargers, as well as the costs and a suggested timeline for implementation. So there are two different level chargers that we are going to be using from Blink and a level two charger is more for residential use. And there's also a level three charger that uh, has a higher power rating that's more efficient. So Blink offers two level two chargers, uh, one with one plug or with two plugs. Uh, and you can see the uh, costs on the chart, which ranges from about $2,000 to $3,000 
as well as installation costs, which is about six thousand uh, dollars, along with yearly maintenance costs, which is four hundred dollars a year, and the lifetime is about ten years. So Blink also offers a level three charger, uh, two different types of DC fast chargers, and this one's more pricey, with the installation cost being about eighty thousand dollars, and the cost per charger ranges from about $38,000 to $70,000. The maintenance is also uh, the same at $400 a year with a 10 year expectancy as well. So because a large proportion um, of the vehicles that we're recommending to switch out are located at the municipal operations center, uh, we're recommending a lot of chargers to be placed here. So. On the northern uh, side, we're recommending two DC fast charging stations. So this will supply uh, charging for the electric electric transit buses. And then just south of that, we're recommending four IQ 200 chargers, um, another four right in the middle. And then in front of the fleet shop um, in the southwestern corner, uh, we're recommending another four chargers uh, to be placed next to the EV arcs that are going to be placed there. And so uh, for cost, a cost breakdown, so the IQ 200 chargers will be about a um, hundred grand, and then the DC fast charging stations um, going to be a little bit more, about three hundred thousand. So in total, it's just going to be just north of four hundred thousand dollars. And then each charger has an annual maintenance of of roughly four hundred dollars. So in total, um, annual maintenance fees would be about five thousand six hundred. Um, and then for the Peoria Economic Development Building, we recommend four of the level two blink chargers to be placed there. Um, for this site, the total cost of the chargers would be $34, about $35,000. Um, and the yearly maintenance looks like it's gonna be about 1,600 a year. Uh, so in this graph, or diagram, we're showing the projected current ones that we're looking into, and that's going to be the development building and the municipal center. Those are shown in the red triangles near the southern part of the county of Peoria, or the city of Peoria. And then the circles are the projected possible locations that we could put the chargers in the future. These are going to be at major intersections of roads near big uh, gathering places such as the lake. And then most of them will be placed in the, uh, in the city center, closer to the southern edge near Sun City. And this is the suggested timeline that we're going to have. Uh, near future, we're looking into electrifying 15% of the fleet with about 25 chargers in place for infrastructure. That will be about 10, 15 year timeline. Midterm will be about 30 years. We're looking at electrifying hopefully 50% of the fleet with 75 to 100 chargers and investing in more EV arcs. And then far into the future, closer to 50 years, we're hoping for a fully electrified fleet with close to 125 chargers and possibly more. And then the infrastructure challenges that would mainly be faced here would be the cost of maintenance uh that is not necessarily something that the city has to deal with currently with uh diesel and gasoline the locations due to urban sprawl as, as the city grows and populations grow in different areas chargers needed are going to change and then the charger levels based on the vehicle type and energy demand that we switch out currently it will mainly be level two chargers but in the future if we change out emergency vehicles and everything like that it'll change it to more DC fast chargers and the cost will go up. And then in addition to this, the availability and types of chargers for emergency vehicles, the main issue will be police cars and uh, fire trucks. These two will require different types of charging. Specifically, fire trucks will need faster charging, specifically DC, but that will deteriorate the batteries faster. And then police cars will also require DC battery chargers, but in different locations. And the final challenge that we're going to face would be the security of the assets being uh, the chargers in place. They're not specifically locked down and they can be tampered with, uh, melded, and then 
basically just messed with by the general public. And that would be one of the main issues that would increase the maintenance and uh, upkeep costs. And so some of our key takeaways is that what most impacts the cost of EV transition is the initial cost of acquiring the EVs in general. Like, um, the most extreme case was the buses. We saw that it cost about $800,000 $800, to transition to an EV option, whereas for the current usage is only about $150,000 to acquire. And there is high variation between locations for different costs and infrastructure opportunities, um, just such as for EVs, the charging costs for overnight, APS and SRP, they charge different rates and also upper tier rates depending on the plan of where and how much is going to be used. A quote from Bob Lutz. Now for the Q&A session. Nice. Sounds good. Also, I want to point out, um, obviously, uh, in the beginning, I said there's like 300 trucks or something crazy like that. Uh, a lot of the trucks, they're not uh, electric options that are, the information is very readily available. Um, obviously, doing, doing, doing research, we found lots of, there's lots of new products that are being uh, tested and, and um, you know, uh, analyzed for potential wide adoption, but currently there's still, it's very nascent stages for a lot of those uh, vehicles. So that's why there wasn't any information about, you know, like your, anything like things that are bigger than a F-350. A lot of those options are, they're not, uh, the, the data is not available to see how much they're costing. And uh, usually probably you're gonna have to deal directly with the manufacturers and getting orders for something like that. But uh, yeah, let's uh, hear some Q and A. Great, I have a mic over here. Can I put you on the spot, John? Do you have any? <laughs> I win, good. Uh, yeah, a few questions. I appreciate all the points that you had there together. Obviously, there's going to be things that we didn't give you information on that would make it challenging. For example, most of those F-350s and 250s, they're purchased because they have unique bodies mounted to them. They have towing and they have a high weight. So even the Silverado would not cross over. It couldn't be used. In fact, most manufacturers won't allow you to take bodies off current, even aluminum structured vehicles and put them on. So you wouldn't have known that. But what I do appreciate is um, kind of your projection. Had you given any thought to, because I think we shared some of our consumption data, 15% of the fleet taken your recommendation, what that draw would match to what the city uses already. Does that make sense to you? So without having to create a, an amount of how much it costs, is there any usage? We know the city uses this much electricity. Let's say we electrify it by 15. What's the ratio? And then we could get a pretty good projection. And then when you go to 50%, you know, what's that compared to what the city's currently using? Because that's the big thing on infrastructure, right? Is it, you know, how much can be pulled in? Cost is a whole different thing. But if you've, if you had anything like that, that would be very int intriguing to know, because I think we supplied some of the city's consumption. So how much are you doubling it? Are you quadrupling it? That would give us a pretty big idea on cost anyhow in a broad band. To me, that's interesting. And then security, which I hadn't thought of, is an also an important one. We've had problems with our public chargers, vandalism. So what are the solutions to that? What is being done in other cities to uh, identify that when you have maybe private facing for us, but you recommend putting it in areas where we may not have property? So how we address that is pretty interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, a lot of those questions would be good by the infrastructure team who unfortunately are not here. So uh, I took down some notes and I, I think those are really good uh, questions that I'm pretty sure we can have reasonable answers for um, in the report. And so that's a good a good thing to get us to do. And so we will make sure we get that in the in the report. Yeah. So yeah, and and I mean we can give you the 
the, the equipment ID because we, it's in the spreadsheet. Um, but the, yeah, so your point about the medium duty vehicles or medium duty trucks uh, is probably useful for us to remove them from consideration because there aren't great replacements right now. So that might affect the total number in the end because those were one of our, uh, our, our most attractive uh, outcome in the in the current set of numbers, um, but y'all can y'all can speak up. <laughs> I could talk forever, but that's what I do for a living. <laughs> some of the sedans. Oh, sorry, I don't I don't really want to talk. Uh, some of the sedans, for example, and again, our data is hard when you know I'm not sitting there to be able to tell you each one for what it used for some of those vehicles I know even though they're flagged as not police they are they're unmarked so we have to factor that in on some of the sedans so one thing you wouldn't know for example is when you're talking a police department unmarked they don't like everything the same because they're going in there to be undercover and not be identified so that's why you couldn't have a whole fleet of of uh, Chevy bolts for the police lieutenant you know uh, unmarked investigative services so those are little niches that you would have to factor in little things you wouldn't know but we would have to deal with is there's a place for a few, but they probably couldn't switch their whole group over. And that's probably our largest segment of sedans. And then you're on the F 150s. Um, so you factored in range, right? You had that all in, and um, you probably found a lot of vehicles that could be, you wonder why we still have them because they're low mileage. You have those. Yeah. And so did you factor that in? If they're very low use, they couldn't be swat switched out, you know, like a minimum, Usability, so a vehicle that's not going to get 5,000 miles a year, which we have a few, you couldn't you couldn't put on an EV because now it's counterproductive. That will never recover it, nor will it. It'll shorten its lifespan, right? Oh, we have three mics. Yeah. Well, that's what we found in our calculations. A lot of the numbers that we found that we were saving for were the vehicles that were using a lot of miles per year. Um, a lot of the time, as you were saying, um, a lot of the vehicles don't get traveled that much, and that's where you make a lot of your money back with EVs. So it was just along with what you're saying, yes, we did factor all that in. Um, as you were saying, if it's not driven a lot, it's you don't get um, a lot of your money's back when it's um, when you if you replace it with an EV. So your recommendations then were based on a decent amount of travel. Yeah, most understanding the charge rate and the return time. And then when you, and you would know it on infrastructure, did you pick a type of level two? Are we talking a, a 40 amp or an 80 amp level two? Was that factored in or was it just kind of a generic? We used a uh, 40 amp. I'm trying to remember what, what was the put in there. Cost so there was a- A little longer, but more cost effective. So how this got into the calculation was there's a, um, there's a, estimate of the number of weekly charge events that need to occur in order to meet the mileage of the vehicles. Um, and that is based on a charge rate and the amount of time it's parked. And so that, that charge rate, I'm pretty sure was based on a 40 amp uh, charger. Yeah. And I didn't see a number. Did they put a number for how many recommended level threes? Did they have that in there? I saw the a dollar amount. I, I wish they were here to answer this. <laughs> okay. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> we have a question for you. Oh, okay. What, what's the what's the question? Uh, you. So the so you're uh, you're the lone rep for infrastructure, I guess. Right? Yes. Okay. So one of the questions was uh, how many level threes did you recommend, and where were they to be specifically? So the level threes we were looking at the MOC, the two for the transit bus area. Is that yeah. what it was? Yeah, and then we did look into different brands, but the different brands weren't recommended by uh, the city. So, uh, sorry, I'm, <laughs> I get cut off real quick. Uh, so, the MOC was the only place we looked at putting the level threes in. The DCSB was not looked into that. Uh, but overall, we would look into putting more level threes into higher traffic areas. In the future, right now, we don't really need more than that at the than you would put at the MOC. Okay. So when those were factored in the initial, because you had some, was that part of the initial phase of electrification recommendation with some of the level threes? Mm -hmm. And that was for the transit. Yeah. That was the reason they were put in there. Yeah. Yeah. 
So, because something you don't know either is depending on which division it is, it's a different funding source. So some things become, have a greater potential to accomplish because they have a different source of funds. So back to the big group on the 15% of recommendations, I heard you mention it. I was just curious if it was factored in when you talked about recommending 15, did you look at, were you doing the age out knowing these are probably coming up for replacement or did you go simply by application and early replacement? Because we talked about, I know I gave you lots of information that typically vehicles are, you know, they're contributing toward a fund to replace them. So if we're looking in real world, it's like, okay, let's look at the ones that are coming up on their expiration dates and we're gonna be thinking about replacing them anyhow. Is that what you kind of leaned on for your 15%? Yeah, we didn't um, We didn't look specifically at their dates saying, oh, these ones are gonna be phased out, but it, it did line up that um, those, um, the ones that were to be phased out, the older ones were the ones that we would save a lot more on. And so it, it just lined up like that. Um, we will look at it more specifically in our report um, so we can align that all like properly and like explicitly. Um, but yeah, based on what we did, um, we didn't, we didn't look explicitly at the years, but, um, it ended up being ma majority of the savings that we got were from the older vehicles that were kind of out of use, kind of ready to be replaced. Thanks, yeah, it is a, yeah, it is this much. I'm going to cut John off. John, do you have any, anyone else? I call on you because you're the project lead. Just um, it, I, I don't know if you were able to do this, but a thought, um, I think this is really good. I think there's obviously social value, we, and I think we're all appreciative of that. Yeah, it really is. I, I think it's the biggest thing from kind of a looking at, at the numbers are the numbers. And one thing that would be really helpful is in the report, if you're still able to do that, if you've already done it and it's not in the presentation, is you talked about cost savings. Um, I'm assuming that's the cost of the vehicle. Or, or not. Um, and what I'm getting at is you have fuel costs, whether it's electric or gasoline or diesel, you've got, you got to repair these things so you can have fleet shot costs. You may have to buy pieces of equipment. So I'm just kind of curious, is there a bottom line kind of, here's the ROI and here's what the true cost is. Um, that would be extremely helpful to kind of see that all in one space. And I apologize if you already have it. So that grid you popped up there is everything? Fuel yeah, that's and, including okay. operation maintenance costs, including fuel costs, based on, you know, obviously we had to pick a number to use for, for diesel and everything. Right. And obviously that's subject to change, you know, due to the whims of the geopolitical environment. Right. But um, yeah, yeah. So that, that includes, that, that's, that's a comprehensive, uh, uh, like total cost of ownership and including salvage value and everything, all that's included. Okay. And then kind of the final, it's just a question in your exploration of the concept that might be more of the, the locational management, the infrastructure piece. Did you pick up on um, how the private sector is doing on, on similar installations of uh, the electric uh, um, source, if you will, um, versus municipal? And I know I don't want to go outside the scope of what you're asked to do, but did you, did you read any interesting articles on that or is it going to happen? Are we still some years out? I'm just kind of curious. Thanks. Uh, it'll probably be a couple of years out, but they'll look more into uh, high traffic urban populations compared to what you're looking at where uh, your fleet would be settled down, which would be mainly urban areas, but a little spread out here and there. Uh, I would like to put out, though, that the installation costs for the chargers, we use the highest uh, cost it would take, which is about six grand, but can go down to as low as 400. So the costs are the highest that they'll possibly be. They can be much lower though. They can, they can always be higher, but you know, <laughs> I assume the city can uh, work some of them out. Okay. Any other questions? I would, and this may be outside your scope, but since you went so deep on the research, great job, by the way, this, this subject baffles me. John is the Batman on this, but I get lost in the numbers. And John has heard this before from me. I feel like we're jumping over hybrid technology. Um, electrification, I agree with the quote from Bob, it's the future. But to your point, electrification, the infrastructure is still a few years out. And we're, it seems like we're jumping to electrification now for the fleet, a municipal fleet that drives around a small city, might make sense. For the general population, 
I feel like we're years away. Did you come across anything that spoke to hybrids, that potentiality? Are we abandoning that altogether? Anything in your research that speaks to that? Take that as a no. <laughs> we were um we actually found that um a few of the vehicles that were given to us were already hybrid vehicles um we were just focusing on um the electrification of it um we found that it would it was getting really complicated when we were factoring hybrid and all that because you can be a lot more flexible with that um there's a lot more um just flexibility in general with everything like the charging when you would charge all of that so um to help our calculations and to help organize things we just focused on the electrification and that's why we only had kind of one vehicle per um vehicle category for that electrification, just so it's easier for us to give you guys numbers and just um, to kind of bring that narrative of electrification and just kind of how it would go based on where we currently are. Um, I think if we talked about like um, hybridization and all that, um, it would be a little more realistic in the, the climate. You know, there's a lot more hybrid vehicles in the market and all of that, but um, just for our calculations and um, our um, focus on like the class as well. Um, that's why we stuck with um, only electric vehicles for that. Did that answer your question? And I think to a lot of cities, that's a big question is like, what do we do with EVs? Which is why John came to us in the first place. So yeah, now you kind of have a better feel for that instead of it being like, a, oh, what if we did that in the cloud sort of thing? Yeah. So good question. And I would also point out to like, I mean, looking at you know, recent legislation and new governance that's getting put in place in California, Canada, of shifting to 100% uh, electrical by like 2035, 2040, 2050. And if you look at uh, the, the schedule that we're looking at, like their, the near term was like 10 to 15, midterm is 30 years. So I mean, 30 years from now, that's that's 2050, right? Um, and, and you know, the, the, the writings in the it's, legislation's out there already where, you know, these are hard cutoffs where we're switching, you know, it's kind of like the argument of, oh, well, we can't just get rid of coal. We have to, and we have to use natural gas to supplement us until we get, you know, enough solar. But, you know, why are we why are we wasting that? You know, let's, we know what this ultimate solution is going to be. We have to, you know, get our pull our resources towards that final goal of, you know, fixing this stuff before you know, <laughs> before it's too late. So, lots of trade offs. That's for sure. Other, I know we. Any other question from your Victoria Park? Yeah, sure. Um, I actually have two questions. One hopefully is the easier one that you can answer right away. And just when you were looking at the charging stations, did you look at or weigh the option of using a solar charging station versus a hard wire? Uh, yeah, so at the MOC, there's already solar the arc chargers, which use solar panels to charge them. Those are already being being implemented in the Southwest corner of the map. Oh, 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 yeah, it's, uh, that one. Yeah, Southwest corner. Uh, so we would put those chargers next to them. Uh, we could obviously input more arc chargers. So then we don't have to take more power from the grid, but that would have a higher startup cost. Solar panels are more expensive. Uh, they'll be more beneficial down the road, though. So it's always an option. Okay, thank you. And then uh, secondly, I was just going to ask, uh, did you look at any other cities that are maybe a step or two ahead, ahead of us that are starting to transition and maybe grab their lessons learned um, that could be shared with us as well for consideration? Um, I feel like in general, there's um, a lot of cities we can kind of look at, but um, I think as we were, we kind of mentioned a bit, um, and I was hearing actually some of the poster groups talking about Arizona's really a specific, especially Peoria, because um, the, the setup, the shape of it, and um, the heat we have here. So it's kind of hard to um, model or use those other cities and their plan and all that, because it was um, con contextual to there. But um, I think we can definitely use um, their takeaways and the lessons learned, as you said, um, based on that. And I think that's where kind of a lot of um, what we already implemented here, um, kind of um, spacing up um, the chargers like this and all that, instead of having a focus in one area, I think that we, we kind of pulled those ideas from like looking at other um, cities and what they did for their electrification. Um, yeah. 
And, and I, I would point out that, um, like I was saying earlier about uh, Montgomery County, Maryland, that was the largest ever bus order. And that's maybe like 6% of their total 12 year plan of replacing all their buses. Um, so a lot of this stuff is just, is a lot of it's just really, really cutting edge, just like brand new. These, the, these, these vehicles are just now being invented and made and uh, you know, the, the Ford E transit just started this, this year, the uh, Mercedes Benz E sprinters next year. Um, a lot of this stuff is, is just, it's, it's so new that there, you know, there's not going to be any cities out there that their whole fleet is going to be electrified probably for, you know, decades to come, um, you know, unless maybe like in China somewhere, some experimental city, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you know, even, even if we take like small steps now, we're going to be ahead of the curve. Um, you know, I'm very confident in saying that. Yeah, thank you. Honestly, just it's a really good in-depth look at the entry level to it because you're right, it's a lot of new technology. And um, hopefully in your, maybe your overall report, you sort of add in some of those comments along the lines of it is new technology. So even the life cycle of vehicles, we haven't quite grasped and or uh, batteries and other things that maybe we're not considering now, you know, the unknowns. But thank you, that was, that was very good. And then I think we'll wrap up. But, well, oh, students, students may not like my comments, so I'm not sure how well this will end up in the report, but there, the, you, you all had, uh, there was a bunch of uh, things that you all brought up that, that I think are really good to think about as um, right now we are like presenting one rollout scenario, whereas there's a bunch of different options. So. Um, it would be really interesting to have you know, grid-based electricity chargers um, as one option, and then what's a, a different option was if you rely on the on the solar-based chargers, um, you might have higher. You're going to have higher upfront costs. You're going to have uh, less uh, impact on the grid, and so there's some things that might be beneficial about it. Um, so it would be useful to show these different options coming out, and this is. Uh, one of the one of the things about research is you at the end of the you find out what you really should be doing, um, and so we'll we'll try to get as much as we can in, into the into the final report and the recommendations. Well, yeah, and Jay has one more question. It's, sure, just one quick question, uh, and that's about standardization with respect to really the infrastructure. When my phone company changes the cord that goes in my phone, it costs me twelve bucks. If anyone changes this stuff. I've got a millions of dollars invested. And did you come across anything? Is, is there an effort underway to ensure standardization or, or at least adaptability? Did that come up in anything you looked at? Uh, that we didn't see that in any reports, but I assume you can just put in an adapter in the future if they do change the ports. Uh, but I would say that you would want to have more charging stations available right now even if you're switching to hybrid com compared to completely electrifying the entire fleet. Because even if you do electrify only half the fleet, do a hybrid, then the chargers aren't worthwhile. Then you'd have to make them available to the public to make it, make it just you know, financially responsible. So I'd say you know, just electrifying it, more chargers, and then the ports, those will be adapted eventually shouldn't be too much of a later cost. Uh, and I would point out, uh, like, recently, you know, within the past, you know, three to five years, the proliferation of these level two chargers has really exploded across the country. Uh, there was a time when there was more, there were more E85 stations than there were uh, level two chargers. But now, now there's like maybe, uh, maybe like 10% of the, the amount of level two charges or EDA five stations at this point. Um, and, you know, that's another like bridge technology that we kind of, it, it, it had its boom and then it, it probably half these people don't know what the, the E85 is. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, I would say like in terms of, of standardization, level two chargers, uh, like the, you know, Tesla obviously, and that, that cultural shift and the, the proliferation of these technologies has made, 
standardization a lot um, more common. Uh, you know, early EVs, you, you know, is, is a roll of the dice whether your your vehicle would be able to be compatible with the charge that you had locally. And most people charged at home, but now that's not the case anymore. It's a lot, it's about you know seeing a, a charger is a lot more common than um, than in decades past. The 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 industry has is trying to they, the, you make, make a vehicle. Um, there's been a lot of work with within the auto industry to make sure that those are fairly standardized. Except for you have Tesla, who wants to go off and do their own thing because they're they're new school. Um, and so they're they're in terms of standardization of the of the chargers. Um, in terms of the plug you're going to put in your car, it's basically you have everyone else in Tesla, um, and and then there's a you know, an adapter and. For level two, I don't think that is likely to change. Level three, there might be um, differences as you get to higher higher voltage systems with, especially with the, the larger vehicles, with smaller manufacturers who do those things. So that that is where you might have more concern than in the level two chargers. <laughs>